first of all, the decision making process is slightly long, but the assessments can be fairly obvious sometimes. So typically, like over the period of years, the way we we typically do it in a committee fashion. So every person in that committee is going to evaluate the candidate on a particular skill set or a particular area. It could be hard skill set, it could be soft skill set, mm. it could be communication, it could be uh, empathy, it could be how genuine that person is, and so on and so forth. For me personally, what I typically look for is honesty, and uh, I'll explain that this is not just theoretical and a vague word. So I typically look for honesty and potential. Okay. Like these are the two things that I typically hunt for. Honesty, because I think a person who's honest and self-aware mm-hmm. is much more important and valuable in it. Welcome back to another very interesting session by Design Sundays. This time we have another awesome guest on the channel. The video you are about to watch is a recording of the conversation I had with Amit Das. Amit is one of the pioneers in Indian design ecosystem. In his 10 plus years journey, he has worked with a lot of companies like Fab.com, Fusion Charts, Housing. Currently, he is the VP of Design and Research at UC Urban Company. In this video, Amit shares his experience and some valuable frameworks to think about careers and what are the skills for future designers. This video is full of crazy good insights. If you have any questions, drop them uh, in the comments below. Enjoy the session. I'm great. Thank you. Um, Thanks for the loaded introduction. I'm I'm, I'm super happy to uh, have you here because I wanted to have you uh, on the channel for a long time. But like, you know, you were in Bangalore and I just wanted to do it in person. And now as we are here, I, I hope to have a great conversation with you and I yep. hope this will be meaning for you as well. Oh, absolutely. Let's and, get started. Yeah. So, like, you know, I I want to ask you a lot about the path a designer should take. But before that, I want to start with, uh, like, you know, what's your background? How did you... Right. So, it goes back much beyond my professional career, which started mm-hmm. in 2010. Some background would help uh, over here. So I'm from ICC board. So naturally we had uh, programming mm-hmm. since I was in class eight. So there was a natural propulsion from schooling and college days that mm-hmm. uh, of course you have to become a computer engineer. Yeah. And uh, so my first job in 2010, which was at a services agency. So I started off as a PHP developer, as a senior PHP developer. Mm-hmm. And uh, which is naturally obviously so because my background before that was always developing applications, making some website as part of freelancing, etc. So looking back, there was there was no such concept of product designer, UX designer back in those days. So that's how it started off. That's how I really hit the ground. And right when I started my job as a developer, it was. Uh, pretty apparent even to me that I started giving a lot of design inputs. It is easier for me to classify those as design inputs today, but back then it was just inputs. So the job role was typically that you have to create something and you have to ship it, Mm -hmm. whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. If it takes talking to a client, so if it takes you putting up some compositions, that's the term that we used to use a lot Mm -hmm. because in Photoshop you would have compositions. So if it requires compositions, so be it. If it requires developing the front end, so be it. If it Mm -hmm. requires building the back end schema, so be it. So that's how it started. Right after my first gig in 2010, I started my own company, Kriya Interactive. Started it as a design agency as well. Not necessarily a design agency per se, but it was just a services agency where design would be one part of it. But we would eventually just be building stuff. We would be building Facebook applications, mobile, web pages, some websites for clients, logos, anything and everything under the sun. It was only after that in 2012 uh, when I got first exposed to the term UX designer. I came across a post, job post on LinkedIn. Uh, It was for this company called Mm Fab.com. And then I looked up that it's a pretty big company in the the US. They had their design and development departments based out of Pune. And so 
I just read through the job description and thought, okay, fine, I do all of these. And it's called, it has a name, you know, so it's called UX Designer. Yeah. So I applied at the company, luckily got through. And I would say, like, my journey of becoming a designer properly under the right conditions of working at a product startup company started from there. So this is the first half of the journey. And after that, most of it was around finding my niche finding whatever I would find uh, much interest in. And so I explored e-commerce with fab.com. I explored charting and data science and business intelligence with vision charts after that. Mm -hmm. Then I started exploring marketplace and real estate with housing.com, which was after that. Tried to do another stab at business intelligence with intelligent interfaces, which was another startup that we tried to grow and build, but it did not, unfortunately. And after that, again, getting back into the B2C consumer market uh, space with Urban Company. Uh, back then it was Urban Club. Right after joining Urban Club, almost about two years down the line, I decided to take a break, which technically did not end up becoming a break. There was another company that was uh, being founded in Bombay, which was trying to solve similar business intelligence and analytics problem. So became part of that, uh, built that for about two and a half, three years. And now back at UC, I'm seeing it. So this is in a nutshell what my journey has been so far. So many, I think the transition, I can actually see how it's playing out because when I also started as a developer, I was giving like what you said as design inputs, yeah. but I didn't know, like this just made sense to me and back then like, yeah. that was done. Uh, okay, we'll, uh, we'll get back to the startups that you did and what you learned from there. But, you know, I, I, I would like to know about how's your day-to-day -day life today? Like, at UC, what do you do on a daily basis? Let me see if I can find a simplified version of this answer. Most of my bandwidth during the day in work context, it gets spent on distilling things that we don't need to build. So most of the meetings uh, with the leadership, senior leaderships, with all the other team members across functions, across different country heads, etc. It's around just building focus. It is very easy for a company like ours, where there is a gazillion problems. Yeah. Everywhere you look, you will easily identify 10 to 100 different problems that need to be solved. So most of our jobs in the leadership team is to just basically distill things to a level where we are working on fewer but high impact items mm. so for instance in any given quarter if there are the teams would typically present 100 to 200 items mm. that we need to build every quarter we know that if we start building all 100 to 200 items we'll end up doing a very shabby job at all of yeah. them it essentially comes down from the same philosophy that if everything is important nothing is mm. so we debate we argue we fight a lot just to find that what are those few 10 to 15 items that we should really be spending our energies on and which have extremely exponential amount of impact. Mm. So in a nutshell, we try to reduce the number of things that we should work on. So would I be correct saying it's like designing or like, you know, path for the company or the organization to go towards, which means removing everything which doesn't make sense right now, something like that. Close enough. Yes, yeah. yeah, because there's a lot of variables that go into where the company is shaped and everyone has their immense amount of contribution towards it. So the founders, for instance, they would have their respective focus areas. Someone is focusing on what should our business top line metric be. Uh, certain business teams, they would be thinking about what kind of new innovations mm -hmm. should we even try yeah. given this is the summer season and we need to launch AC. In the tech team, which is what all of us are typically yeah. part of, and we try to see that are there problem statements or there are opportunities that could be tech first and we see a clear opportunity that yes we can solve those and if yes there are so many of them and then which ones should we be building or working on the other way to look at that would be there is a function of scale that always comes into the picture yeah given a company like uc i feel we are lucky that we get to play on both the sides we sometimes get into the zero to one mode Sometimes we get into this 1 to 100 mode. So in certain categories or in certain problem statements, we're very early. So we don't even know what the solution is. Forget about at scale solutions. So 
we try to be extremely frugal and very experimental in nature in certain areas where we know that we have had past success now the new problem statement then becomes that if it had past success now how do i replicate that success across countries across geographies yeah right so in a sense what you mentioned that if we are trying to design the direction of the company in a sense yes all we try to do is we try to make it extremely real it becomes very easy to digest when in a town hall or once a quarter meet up we say that okay the company's target is doing xyz million gmv this year versus making it real for each and every member in the team that okay fine the numbers are great like these are great targets what do i do today as a designer or what do i do today as an engineer that is going to make that happen yeah is fixing this widget box going to impact the annual gmv targets how if yes how so most of our job lies at the this interjunction that we try to make all of those things distill down to a level where it becomes real for all of us mm. nice i i think a lot of it is about stakeholder alignment yep. and uh, with like you know at uc skill there are a lot of products and lot of functions so like you know multiplied by number of stakeholders yeah. you need to get everyone aligned mm. that makes sense and apart from that yeah so uh, just to complete the answer for your question what does a typical day to day look like for me so part of it is this which is uh, reducing the number of problem statements that we should be working on most of the other time it gets into brainstorming sessions brainstorming mm-hmm. new solutions if you are uh, what is the mode of testing those solutions finding opportunities are we even picking the right opportunities and then design reviews in my case and then sitting with folks doing one on ones understanding if there are any blockers yeah where could we help where does the team need my help to unblock them in certain other areas yeah so yeah so uh, in a nutshell this is what i do i do it handful i think like uh, you have got like i i, I don't know like uh, do you have free time on like <laughs> at least big days by choice yes to certain extent so i believe in focused execution so like i try to block a good chunk of the first productive hours for only this work i try to spend uh, my late evenings and night with family friends mm-hmm. yeah so as it goes right if you are part of a startup if you like it or not it's always in your head you're always constantly fiddling with the problem statements of the day so idealistically like people would say that don't take work home don't bring work home mm-hmm. but we don't bring it physically but it's always with us you mentioned uh, a lot of things from aligning the people to like you know focusing on a few problem statements to like you know spending time with the like team and one doing one on ones and and i have done like a few and i really like it but like like what if you have to pick one what's the best like one thing that you love doing if i have to pick one i would say it would be the one on ones okay and the, the the reason why that is uh, one of my favorites is that when you start building a team and i'm i'm talking in uc context uh, in this instance so back in the days when the team was just growing first it was me plus one more person although the problems are hard and then there are a lot of them because you have like 30 40 50 100 member business team uh, member business teams and all of them would have problems they will all converge to you Mm-hmm. and only one or two designers who had to ship it yeah the good part is that because it's let's say it's just me as a solo designer i know mm-hmm. exactly like what i need it to be i would be the decision maker for design mm-hmm. and uh, i just get it done mm-hmm. fairly easy it's not easy but like if you get to think about it the decision making yeah. is fairly yeah, easy yeah. now as you start growing the team mm-hmm. across verticals yeah one of the challenges that i have faced it's a very common challenge when the team grows is that how do you ensure that the person in your team they get it and this is this is one of such areas where multiple stakeholder management comes into picture for example if the ceo has hired me or the co-founders at uc they have hired me to do a job that amit you are going to look after design and research they would have painted some picture in their head that okay 
here is an offering that we have in the market. We need it to look good. We need it to be good. And we need to, most importantly, communicate it to our, our users, which are our partners as well as customers. Mm -hmm. This app is good and this is taking care of your home, your wellness, etc. So they would have painted some picture that we need to, we envision a future that five years down the line, this is what UC is going to be looking like. Who's the person to get it done? For them, it is Amit. Similar for engineering, if they see that, okay, there is a lot of tech advancements, there are a lot of things that we can do, make the app faster, bring in new technologies to empower our partners to deliver the job, etc. For them, the abstracted version would be, let's say, Kana, who heads engineering. Yeah. Yeah. And they would say that, Kana, okay, you are the point guy. So if something goes wrong, they don't need to worry about it. They would just point it to Kana. The relationship between a founder and us functional heads is that we get it. You just have to tell me, Amit, yaar, ye na maza nahi aara. Yaar, this has a bug. And that is the only statement that he needs to make. And he would be rest assured that either one of us will take care of it and we'll figure out how to get it. The same thing translates when you start building a team. In this case, let's say a design team. So for instance, if you are working on international or if some other teams, they are working on the customer app, some other teams are working on partner apps. Because we have the 360 degree picture, we start painting a picture. You know what? Six months down the line, our customer apps should invoke certain kind of feelings mm. within the users who are actually interacting with it. This is how I want folks from Dubai start feeling uh, about the app. Yeah. And then I will start painting a picture. And then what happens is I want to communicate that, hey dude, like, you know what, what about something like this? And I would expect that that person gets me. Mm. They can add their flavor, they can do whatever, right? But they at least get to know how it is it to work with me. That, okay, Amit has this vision and Amit is also giving me this vision because that is also one of the distilled visions of the founders, mm. right? And that's why one-on-ones come in. Yeah. What other way is there for me to start communicating all of these things, all mm. of these ideas, right? So, yeah. in, so this is one of the advices that I had given one of my uh, ex-colleagues at Cuddle that I feel that most of the time when you're working with your oversight, in my case, it could be one of the founders, is that I like to treat myself as a dustbin sponge. So I'm the dustbin, you have any cotton, it could be a crappy idea, it could be a good idea, just keep throwing at me. I'll figure out how to give it form, how to make it work. And that is the same kind of expectations I would have with my team, that at least all of you get me. This is how is it to work with me. This is how is it that you need to convince me that this flow will work. I am going to take that bet. And if you can convince me, I'll have your back. Yeah. And similarly, if I'm convinced that something like this will work, and then I go and convince my founders or other stakeholders, they'll say, okay, fine, you are convinced, we will have your back. Let's ship it. Yeah. And that's why one-on-ones are extremely important because that's the only opportunity I get to work with specific, more meticulous details with individuals, understand what their blockers are, how are they thinking, what are their career choices, how are they seeing themselves as part of UC or the design team, what do they want to do in their lives over the next five, six years, one year. And then it becomes my job to align the vision of the company and then the vision of the team and then the vision of the individual together. So Amit, you're one of those people who have experience uh, in B2B to see and you have done your own thing as well so let's let's talk about what's what's the difference between working in a b2b setup versus b2c uh, setup as a designer okay so as a designer fairly straightforward for all your viewers who are working in either or one of those domain yeah. uh, i'm just trying to uh, simplify it to a in b2c the reliance is a lot on product market fit naturally and hence with limited access to capital, limited access to talent, people need to reach to that stage much faster. Essentially, with all historic companies, you might have seen it yourself that once a good B2C startup comes in, there are a lot of other competing players mm -hmm. that immediately kick in. So naturally, the objective of a company becomes to reach to a stage of good engagement, good user base much faster. So as a designer, you can find yourself in an environment where you will see a lot of things are changing almost on a day-to-day -day basis. Entire PRDs, entire feature scopes, everything, it's just changing overnight, on an overnight basis. 
and you will find yourself doing a lot more explorations, a lot more testing, dirty testing, quick and dirty research methods, releasing to actually see how people are responding to it, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, so you will find yourself in a much fast-paced environment. On a B2B stage, however, at least in my limited experience, what I have seen is that the focus is a lot on getting it right the first time because you're selling to a business, hmm. which in turn could be selling to other customers or to their own staff members. B2B to B to C. Yeah. So so you know you have the visibility until B2B. Hmm. And then what the business chooses to do is something which is yeah. another game altogether. Now that second B, the business, could be at an SMB stage, which is a mid to large scale companies to an enterprise scale as well and what happens is that a lot of due diligence comes in into picture that if you're building a, few, a feature a business would invest in buying your software or offering once they feel that that particular solution is actually precisely solving their problem hmm. unlike b2c in b2c what happens is you release a feature five out of ten users might find it helpful other five might not find it helpful but it's okay you're trying to increase the number of people who are finding it helpful yeah. in b2b because you're selling it to a business you need to ensure that you're selling something that the business requires to the point mm -hmm. and that's why you're building a software which has a lot of features and typically you will see that most of the SaaS companies which typically sell to other businesses be it something as familiar as an hrms portal that mm -hmm. we typically interact with on a monthly basis you will see it has typically most of the similar features because we as company we need a payroll system or an HRM system to give us all of those specific features right so naturally they would not want or expect breakages in the system so you will typically get more time per feature mm. as a designer so if there is feature one you will probably get about two to three weeks or even more to work on that feature find out each and every possible use cases, fix it, and then ship. Because the stakes are extremely, extremely high. Yeah. And on the other, on the flip side, if you sell it to another business, it is very likely that they are not going to bail out on you. They're going to continue using your software as long as your software continues to stay valuable to them. Yeah. Unlike B2C, because you're changing things on a very frequent basis, you will see that customers sometimes would not be very loyal, they would move from an Amazon to a Flipkart or I don't know, like from a Facebook to Instagram, even though it's their own uh, line yeah. of products. So what does it mean for a designer in a nutshell? In my experience, I have seen that we tend to go, we have the opportunity to go very, very deep into a particular problem when it's a B2B setup versus we rely on a lot of experiments, quick and dirty experiments, and we focus on pace mm -hmm. much more when it comes to a B2C setup. Another way to put it, what I typically ask some of the other designers to put on their resume is that instead of a uh, number of years of experience, if you're transitioning from B2B or B2C, you should write the number of experiences per year. So in a B2B, you will typically find that you might have worked on four to five projects per year. Versus when it's a B2C setup, you'll find yourself working on at least 30 to 40 things per year. Yeah. yeah. When I was switching, I actually thought I have done like like 12 ish projects but when I started writing it down documenting it down uh, like it was 24 and I didn't know like I have done yeah. so much so I think that is I think that's very relevant and uh, uh, relatable as well I think when I have done some B2B work or B2C work I have seen that okay now I, I would like to take a little tangent here and I would like to ask you how like you know how did Kriya or like intelligent uh, interfaces. interfaces how it helped you as a designer when you started this th these were your own startups right how how actually like you know they help in as a designer or as a leader got it to be very honest it did not help me a lot as a hard in the hard skill of a designer mm -hmm. uh, but what it helped with was providing me with a lot of dimensions and lenses to mm -hmm. look at something from. So typically what happens is, at least in my career, I have experienced that whenever I had, in the initial days, been a hardcore designer, I would look at anything and everything from a design. Building your own stuff, it gives you, it forces you to look at anything and everything 
uh, from different lenses. For example, at Kriya, there was a project where we had to build a Facebook application. Back then, Facebook apps and micro apps were a thing. Yeah, games and games and stuff. And yeah, 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 games, micro applications, lead generation platforms were there. So think of all the stakes that I have as the founder of Create Director, right? If I were just a designer at Kriya, I would look at that problem state. I think it was for a movie and uh, they wanted to create a micro game for that movie that was to be launched on Facebook. If I were just a designer, I would spend all my time in creating the best fucking game there is around this movie concept on for Facebook. As a founder, I was going to look at it from ROI standpoint as well. The mm-hmm. client has given me a limited budget. Yeah. They have given me a problem statement. They have given me a target that from Facebook, I need to capture at least X amount of leads. Yeah, so they mean business there. Yeah, and creating a game for that lead generation purpose is one of the methods to achieve hmm. that number. Okay, so I'm looking at few things that how much runway do I have hmm. with that capital that I just freshly received from my client. I have a few de- developers in the team. I have to pay their salaries as well. If I have the team work on this project for one month, it is going to take up and utilize the entire money. So I will not have any money left in the bank to invest back into the company. Mm -hmm. So my company is not going to grow. So what will I do? I will put some barricades around it. That you know what, our budget is actually half of what the client gave. Mm -hmm. Can we come up with more creative solutions? Okay. So the designer and the developer, in back then I was a designer. There was one more person as well. So we said that, okay, fine, we can't spend two to three weeks just designing this. Mm-hmm. We have to come up with some options or designs within a week. Okay. Yeah. Just this mindset that I have to be cost conscious as well, mm-hmm. forced us to not be extremely relaxed and see that, no, we are designers. Mm-hmm. We are artistic by profession and in our DNA. So we need a space and time to explore. We said, but it is not going to become a viable business if we start operating like that. Mm. So we put a time constraint that yes, we need to deliver this project in less than a month with half the resources in half the time. And why are we doing that? So that we have enough room to take out from the client budget so that we can invest it back into the company. Mm -hmm. So it is in the long run for our growth. So so these kind of decisions helped me as a designer along the way. Mm -hmm. So whenever after that, we started looking at any product feature or problem, we start questioning that design the whole thing. Yeah. First question is, do we need it? Mm. If yes, what is the core problem that we're trying to solve? For example, if there is one screen and on that screen, I'm, I'm talking in pure design language, right? So there is one screen, there's a problem statement. Yes, we need to give some visibility. Eventually it come down to that. Yes, we need to build a card. Mm-hmm. That's it. The first question is, why do we need a card? Mm. It is not that which design system are we going to follow? Which color scheme? What kind of copy are we going to write? No. The first question is, do we even need it? Yeah. If yes, why this card? Why is there not any other solution options? And there are many such examples. We can talk it along the way in as much granularity as possible. But principally, as you asked, right? Like, how did those experiences help me as a designer? I think it helped me get a lot of different lenses and dimensions. So while on one hand, it is very easy to become the designer where you're just the hammer looking for a nail mm-hmm. and everything is a nail to you, right? I'm a designer. I can design the hell out of everything and call it that I'm changing the world versus even questioning that for this kind of job, do you even need to be the hammer mm. or do you need to be the chisel? Yeah. So yeah. Dude, that, that's very interesting because when you were talking about the experience of choosing to do something in let's say half the budget or half the amount uh, like half the time right it actually forces you to uh, think in terms of constraints and then you actually are like thinking from a business perspective that i have to run a business it's not just about designing design is simple right like i think one of the things that i have noticed about you is design comes naturally to you ye ho jai. Let's talk about, is this viable? Do we need to do this? Does this make sense for us? Like, you know, six months or let's say next quarter or next three quarters, right? For it, it, does it make sense? Yeah. uh, You can extend this anywhere, right? So a very typical question that I tend to get in the community or from other designers is that, how do we find time 
Yeah. It's one of the questions that even you asked me. Where do you find time? Mm-hmm. And the constant is fairly straightforward. If you we can say that most of the folks who are all of us who are in the startup ecosystem, mm-hmm. uh, we're typically running on our toes all the time. Yeah, we are always onto something. But then the foundational question arises that we are always executing. Mm. When are we learning? Yeah. When are we taking a pause and spending time in reading some books or listening to some podcast? But if you think about it systematically, then you will say that, okay, if I, I need to buy some time. Mm. So every week I'm going to spend, let's say one to two hours mm. only on self-learning, mm. learning about new concepts. But how do I buy that time? So naturally, there are a few options the way you can do it. Either I can work less. Mm. So what I'll do is I'll pick up few projects that are high impact but low effort. Yeah. There won't be effort, but relatively speaking. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you do? You start questioning things naturally. Naturally. With your PM, with your engineers, you start questioning things. Do we really need to do this? Are you really, really sure it is going to create that huge impact? And most of the times, if you follow the simple process of five voice, you will get to see that. It's not required. Actually, this is very like very helpful, and I think a lot of people can actually use this method to understand why we always uh, like you know tell designers to ask questions around why this needs to be done in the first place. Is it worth my time and stuff like that? So one of uh, the ways I have taught this to my mentees uh, is think about this as chips. Like you have like your uh, chips as in you can make certain bits and you can't make all the bits, yeah, right? Yeah. So let's suppose if you have 10 chips and there are 30 things, you cannot spend it on all. Yeah. So define like, you know, which battles to pick. Yeah. Because you can't... What are your own big bits? Yeah. That's the, I think, that's in... in and everyone should do this with their time. If it's not worth yeah. their time, then you should maybe not do it. But you see, like the foundation in the construct is very simple. It's mm. the same different lenses and dimensions mm. that's it you yeah. can apply it to earning more time you can apply it to i want to make the best referral system or do i want to make one referral system one card redesign one purchase journey. yeah and your time is limited mm. right your effort is limited where would you rather spend most of the time mm. the way to do that the process to come to that is applying more and more lenses mm. just a designer lens is not going to suffice or cut Oh, we are going some like this is some really deep thinking and I think I have learned this of like you know by making a lot of mistakes right all of us uh, yeah <laughs> that's so, the only way I feel so if you are watching this this is like mind-boggling I if I think about it when when Amit was talking I was also thinking about the experience I have had in the past where I have given something let's say one and a half months of my time I could have done better things like you know and in in the hindsight but cool very very interesting so you mentioned two things like in the conversation i just want to refer back to that so first you mentioned that in in like you know when you are helping someone uh, let's say i'm working on an international bit for urban company and you come to me and you say that uh don't probably this is the way the you know dubai customer should think about urban company and uh, right now you mentioned how do you find time for like you know reading a book or updating yourself so i want to understand what what were the sources for you in the last 10 years as you have been in the industry for 10 years to learn and actually get the this much knowledge and what were the sources so first of all i don't think i have this much knowledge or whatever okay uh, but my there are, there are these usual suspects, right? So I try to stay as observant as possible. Mm. My means to do that is, I think Twitter is very helpful. I have gained a lot. Every time I open Twitter, like there is someone who is super duper knowledgeable, super duper smart, they will share something. Mm. And I would find most of my books recommendations, uh, some case studies, uh, etc. from Twitter. And, and then I use Google a lot. So I think both of these expand what I should be reading to begin with. I don't typically go for digests or if someone has written a book review or a case study on how they solved or they did a concept redesign or something like that. I don't typically enjoy those. What I typically get in 
find enjoyment is around this i am very curious by nature so if i know that urban company has a huge potential market in the next 5 to 6 years in abu dhabi and dubai i don't seek for answers i seek for the right questions to ask because answers i'm pretty sure that uh, all of us in the company are pretty smart they can figure out yeah uh, but the good part is i think the more uh, valuable contribution that i can give is finding the right questions to ask for instance i would not start looking for how do people buy uh, services in abu dhabi that's not a typical question that i would ask i would uh, typically go for uh, uh, what are the shopping habits to be having Hmm. and that's just a starting point and then i would see ki every year there could be some festivals where people are extremely excited about hmm. what drives it is it status is it something else etc okay so that is a point yeah so shopping habits and i'll just keep it noted somewhere hmm. and then i know that at some point in time in the future if you are working on something similar i'll just nudge that in your direction that you know what probably worth a try just go and explore what their shopping habits are right hmm. because even i don't know the answer yeah what are the emotion constructs for that matter we have a lot of e-commerce in our product uh, we have purchase journeys for our skus etc i can just be aware a little bit about it that it's one of those countries where social norms are very different than the ones we experience in india yeah but what are those social norms i don't typically go out looking for that answer uh, because it is not in the top of my mind around what i'm doing today but i'll just keep it noted somewhere so for instance if you are going to work on it after 2 months uh, i can just nudge you in that direction that hey you know what maybe the copy or maybe the graphics you are going to use around tips or purchase or whatever just see if there is any geographical context or condition around it in for abu dhabi or abu dhabi versus dubai hmm. i'll just nudge you in that direction because i have seen that yes that is something that comes up pretty often a good example for that would be I think in Spotify they have one of their values as relevance. Hmm. So where a romantic playlist in the US would have a thumbnail of yeah. two people kissing each other, the same thing for Abu Dhabi would be two palms faced yeah. down hmm. downwards and on top of each other. Yeah, you you shared that in yeah. our and like you know you you keep sharing that in our groups and I think that that is one of my sources of. like you know upgrading as yeah and and then i don't try to read through it that how did they come to this particular graphic but i know that of course there will be some geographical nuances mm. there will be some cultural nuances yeah. so that's just an open ticket item for me i know that whenever some project would come up i'll just nudge someone in that direction that's mm. it i'm pretty confident that if you pick that up okay there's another good question to answer that is yeah right so coming back to the sources i think twitter is one i google a lot and naturally very curious i'm curious about anything under the sun so i keep googling random shit no actually the, i think one of i i think in in all the good designers what i have noticed is curiosity is not something they learn they actually like very curious about anything matlab why is this this way and how can i do it right everything like sort of fascinates me right yeah. and and i have seen this with like all the good designers right they are observant they are curious and, and this this is something like i think helps yeah yeah do you want to disagree or something no 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 i i don't disagree with it. i also think that it is, a lot of people think that you are born curious or something like that and sometimes it cannot be learned because it's something that you do innately mm-hmm. and I genuinely feel that as designers anyone who's in the ecosystem we already have all the tools to even become curious mm. in research any goddamn blog you pick up or research 101 blog you pick up around the internet any book you pick up one of the basics that they'll teach you is to follow the 5 w's mm. five boys five boys yeah. if you even don't think about being curious or trying to attribute as i'm a curious person if you just follow that process that is nothing but a proxy for being curious yeah why are we sitting here mm. okay we are sitting here for an interview why an interview and then the next question and then the next question i i might not be genuinely curious as a human being mm. but i'm trying to be very diligent to this job which is of a researcher which is of a designer mm. and so i'm following that process and That's if i'm following that process yeah and i'm just following that process and over a period of time all my insights that i have documented those are the output of that curiosity hmm. then also it becomes 
so once you start getting the the meaty stuff right then you also start so it's a cycle right yeah. the more you do it the more you want to do it yeah. because you have learned something yes. and, and yeah makes sense and so simply put trust the process hmm, trust the process as a designer you should obviously yes. okay uh, now i want to get into the like you know sides where what new designers can learn but from starting from there one thing that you think that you would have known back then that you know now if you would have known back then would have made you a better designer take more risks okay i think looking back i can say that i did not take one might argue looking at my linkedin profile that this dude takes a lot of risks okay mm-hmm. given that i have explored a lot of companies in the past by will i i loved working at each and every one of those companies so someone might argue that no you are pretty like like a risk risk etc but i think not risky enough i think looking back it is possible the ecosystem the startup ecosystem it has it is at a stage where it encourages people to take bolder risks so as a designer i probably could have taken like i i don't even know what risks would that have been would have been key try out starting more companies mm. what the hell right what is the worst that can happen so i i don't think i had taken uh, as many risks mm-hmm. as i would have loved my younger self to have taken mm. makes sense yeah cool so like you know that was the skill I, or like you know one thing that you would want to like you know you would have done what do you think are the skills for designer in the future let's say today or some if someone is starting today or 2 years from now what are the skills that's going to be most important for designers got it so let me answer this to you with sort of a framework so the way i look at it is that we as designers uh, we have soft skills we have sales skills mm-hmm. okay which is a major major part of our role uh, then we have the hard skills i think most of these skills would become commoditized over a period of time just to give you a sense of it 6 years ago 5 to 6 years ago if one were to publish a good design they would have to learn about color theory about type hierarchy do their homework in most cases like folks would either go to a design school or design college whatsoever right to even publish a good looking design okay today you have thousands and thousands of ui kits yeah readily available almost for free so if there is a new person who's going to come up and say that hey you know what i'm a great visual designer they nestle don't have to do shit they can download a few files from the internet compile it together bang done yeah to an extent where ios and material sorry android sdks they come shipped with their native ui kits so you see what was a skill set before is commoditized today yeah so today the skill set has moved on to becoming that a good ui sense for instance is table stakes right now mm. it's 100% hygiene you have to be good at it because it is already commoditized mm-hmm. what you have to be good at is when to apply what yeah and what kind of design does your business need mm. right so for instance if the trend is all black ui dark ui does your business even need that mm. so that is where we are getting at right and we are getting into those kind of debates and discussions now fast forward a few years what i see is in terms of hard skill set most of the work that we are doing around let me call it the production part the production part of design where we are stitching things together creating flows etc i think most of it is going to get commoditized and so to stay relevant folks will have to move to another set of skill sets i'll cover that as well but just to cover on the hard skill set part i think newer technologies and services are going to come in <clears throat> for example mobile uh, as a platform never had the hero seat in the ecosystem until iphone launched yeah before that it was all web ui web. so people had to transition their hard skill set from designing for desktop to mobile Mm-hmm. and now today most of the portfolios that we get to see all will have app use cases mm. hardly will someone have like 9 out of 10 folks who would uh, apply they would have mobile screens as the portfolio use cases mm. not desktop web right yeah 
if you look at how the ecosystem how the technology world is moving forward of course in the future you will see more augmented reality stuff coming in so people will now be designing for spatial surfaces mm. not necessarily just 2d surfaces right so when it comes to art skills i see that natural transition happening from 2d screens there is going to be more interactive AR, VR, VR. I'm not very sure how much the adoption is going to be, but I'm pretty sure when it comes to a hard skill set in design, uh, it's going to be one of those which is moving towards AR. Mm -hmm. Then comes, I feel, one of the very important part is understanding users. Mm -hmm. I feel that part is not going to get commoditized anytime soon. So understanding users again, it can be bucketed into two parts. You have qualitative and quantitative qualitative done with enough volume will convert into quantitative but the ability to extract insights the quant part of it will get commoditized there are a lot of phenomenal analytics tools mm. that do that beautifully well and more and more are getting created with every passing quarter but the ability to interact with humans sit down with them understand that what is their core need that yeah. drives them to take certain calls on an app or with your product I think that is a skill set that people need to learn over and over again and that is going to sustain. I also feel with folks that I interact with that that is one skill set that people don't do enough. And it's it's sort of like a fallacy that because the production part is good enough so everything else can be masked around it. For example if if let's say one of the apps is great and we are only relying on production data so I can make an excuse to an extent where you can say, I don't need to talk to the user, right? Yeah. So they're using it and I see how they're behaving. Mm -hmm. I will never have to step out of my office, pick up the phone and talk to a user and understand why did they do what they did or whatsoever. And I can still get away with it. Is that going to be sustainable? Will I still be relevant five years down the line? Absolutely not. Yeah. Because all of that part will get commoditized. Mm -hmm. Then what the fuck are you supposed to do at a company? But the ability to take good interviews, ask pressing questions enough which are not leading, yet you are extracting information out of someone without the dark practices and all of that. But I think that that skill set is going to be more and more relevant moving forward. Yeah. So yeah, as a designer, I feel if I personally had to bet my money on few skill sets that I think should be, there should be courses and curriculums around it, is uh, one, how to think in systems. Uh, I don't think a lot of folks in the ecosystem think in system design standpoint. They don't mm -hmm. do that. So everyone has a narrow vision on how this app or this screen is supposed to look like. But is there a designer who understands business equally good enough? They understand numbers equally good enough. They understand operation nuances equally good enough to take a design call. So I think that is one skill set which is only going to become more and more relevant in the future. The second one is to understand users because users are also evolving. So the methods that we use today will not be relevant tomorrow. Yeah. Back in the days, you could have mimicked an ad in the form of a blog post and users would fall for it, right? But it would die off. Mm. After one or two years, users will evolve. They know, okay, ah, this is exactly the same trick yeah. from the book, but that's the only trick you knew. So if people, if you start getting more and more users to interview rooms, and if you ask the same standard templatized questions, after a point in time, they will talk or they'll get to know that, okay, ha, there's another usability testing session. Oh, okay, fine. I have to use the app and all of that. Yeah. So I'm not going to be myself. This is not my organic behavior on your platform. Mm. How do you change that? Right? So because even users are evolving. Yeah. However, the practices that we use today when it comes to testing, user testing, usability testing, user research, talking to folks, interviewing them, those practices, if you look at the theory, that has not changed in the last 10 years. And so who's to say that the data that you are getting today, even at UC for that matter, mm -hmm. is that even unbiased data or is it exactly what we want to hear? Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think these few skill sets are going to be super duper relevant in the next five to 10 years. I think this is, this is so good right now. If you think about it, thinking in systems, I, I, I personally think not like if I meet 10 designers, I'll not actually meet nine out of 10 won't be thinking in a systematic way. They'll be thinking, how do I make this flow or like, you know, how do I make this part of the app or something like that? But how does it connect to the whole thing? People don't know that. Uh, talking to the users, I think 
this is this is something that i have seen that a lot of people get it wrong by just like they go out and just try to talk to people in a very you know ki yeah, i just want to talk to people but it's, it's it's like you have a prescription you do it yeah. but it's more about what we talked about like curiosity and what do you want to learn from them yeah. what do you want to see like you mentioned about like i'll rather know the uh, buying behavior than ki किस क्या चीज पे वो क्लिक कर रहे हैं एंड स्टफ लाइक दैट राइट सो आई थिंक दैट दैट बिकम्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सो अकॉर्डिंग टू यू व्हाट्स द राइट वे फॉर समवन टू चूज अ कंपनी टू वर्क विद लाइक अ फ्यू डेज बैक आई एंड यू आर हैविंग अ कन्वर्सेशन रिमेंबर दैट व्हेन अ पर्सन वाज स्ट्रगलिंग टू मेक अ डिसीजन बिटवीन शुड ही बी जॉइनिंग अ स्टार्टअप व्हिच इज थिंक अ वेरी स्मॉल स्टार्टअप और अ billion dollar company so how do you think about that how how should a person uh, go about that a lot of founders might not like this answer naturally of course but i feel at least every time i give similar advices to someone let's look at both the sides someone who's planning to hire this designer and then there is a set of i'm assuming for answering this question i'm assuming we are referring to younger designers who are just coming out and they are at the earlier stage of their journey a founder would typically want to invest their time energy into someone who they would think that align with their mission statement okay. so a very missionary driven mm-hmm. approach employees or potential employees or designers on the other hand in, in in some cases of course they understand the mission statement very early on and one can simply say that yes i want to go ahead and do my contribution towards this mission right if that is the case then it's a great win win situation right so where you are aligning always with the problem statement mm-hmm. or the mission statement and then you figure out along the way what are the paths that can be taken is you you might start with design but then you can move on to something else like i personally experienced as well i i started off as a developer and then i moved into design okay what's up the only advice that i typically start with is that don't start by thinking as a designer mm-hmm. it limits your options in the future significantly so design if you think about it is it could be looked at as a mindset it could be looked at as a skill set as well if you start looking at it as a skill set then your options naturally become very limited because yeah. you're looking at a company where i will be able to exercise this skill set mm-hmm. it could be any company it could be a grocery company could be a food ordering company it could be an e-commerce company a lot of company and most of these companies would need interfaces interfaces need to be designed well usable right what are the things and the skill sets that are required to publish those user research uh, interaction design user experience design product design you why you name it right you have we have a plethoric amount and we are saying that any of these companies they would require those skill sets and i just want to latch on to one of those to practice my skill set the mindset approach basically tells you that i want to learn how this product would solve someone's problem mm-hmm. my approach or my contribution towards solving this problem is via the skill set that i know which is design mm-hmm. and it can very easily be moved on or merged with something else mm. for instance i might join a very early stage startup let's say let's say zomato 10 years ago mm. that okay someone has a vision that Uh, what if i make all the menus available online so that people don't have to step outside yeah uh, and go to the physical spaces to even make a choice mm. that is a problem statement and uh, okay even i have this problem or i really like this problem statement i would like to be part of the solution but you know what to contribute to the solution the skill set that i have today is design but then i will always try to find that i have all the levers i have the mindset of design i know how to extract insights or understand opportunities via user research mm-hmm. i know how to make menus much more interactive and let's say visually pleasing because i have the skill set of ui mm-hmm. or visual design i would also know that how can that translate into a different interface using the skill set of a product designer so that is a mindset game mm-hmm. and i'm thinking that even though i might know just one i can just latch myself with that problem statement and learn the others mm-hmm. along the way Yeah. there could be a business angle to it there could be other angles to it 
So I typically, my personal advice to folks is typically to sway away from the skill set mindset that don't aim for becoming a UI designer at a company or don't aim to become a head of design at a company to become a lead designer at a company. Join with the mindset of that whatever design skill sets I know or want to learn, I see that there is an opportunity at this company. For example, there could be a designer who says, I I want to design businesses. I want to design systems at a core level. And then I see how it manifests into an interface or into something else altogether. They might pick a company that, you know what, here is a company that is both in operations, hardcore operations, as well as they have an interface. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a good fit for me because that is exactly what I want to learn. Vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis someone who wants to say that, hey, you know what, I want to make uh, fun stuff. Okay. We, uh, like an ideal company for that would be a social networking app uh, or an Instagram or a Snapchat because that is that company or by business model it is going to give you that opportunity to grow. Who said that today if you just want to design those monster creatures or emojis tomorrow you can't evolve those. But if you start with that hey you know what my target or ambition is I want to become a lead designer at this company then it doesn't matter like there is no mission statement you join any company go by the number of years of experience crack your interviews and you will become part of that. Yeah. Will you be passionate about it? Will you be very, very deeply excited about the job you're doing? No, because you are chasing the title, mm. the, the position. Yeah. Um, but to choose a company, I simply put it down to that one is your intent, which is covered by the mindset. Design mindset versus design skill set. The other one is look at the company itself. What are the opportunities that company by its definition can provide you? Mm -hmm. Which is, is it a high growth company? Do I want to work? coming back to the same reference of number of experiences per year, mm. right? I, I want to do a lot of stuff, right? Would I join a B2C or a B2B? I'll join a B2C. I'll join a services company because mm -hmm. are, their assets are always on fire, yeah. right? So that in the same given year, I can do 20 to 30 different kinds of projects. Mm. And maybe after that, I get a sense that, hey, you know what? I worked on films, I worked on tech products, I worked on e-commerce, I worked on logistics. And I have worked on all of these projects, so I have enough understanding about the businesses. And now I know that these two are my favorites. So mm. now if I want to go deep, services companies might not be the best option for me. Some services companies are yeah. there with their contractual yeah. agreements, etc. But then I can now pick and choose. So this is typically what I would recommend. So course. like taking more risks. Yeah. Right. Like if you do it, if you are in a services company, I what you're saying is you'll get to work on different, different industries and you can then like, you know, learn about, for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is a very good way. And and that day in this conversation, when we were talking about it, you, you actually talked about the, like, you know, skill, like, do you want to be very mindset first? Do you want to connect with the problem statement and everything? Or do you want to get attached to the tagline or, or the title, right? Like product designer, this or yeah. that. Or, and there are many ways to look at it, right? So one of the interviews that I, met, I was taking last week, a similar question came up, like how do I decide? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I asked that person was that if at all, I don't expect you to answer this question, but if at all, uh, because you are the current design ecosystem in the country is pretty mature. Folks from school and college luckily have access to all the other great designers in the ecosystem, right? And so I asked him a question like, that I'm sure you are in talks with other folks and he mentioned as well. So I asked him, what do you want to do in the next five years? Where do you see yourself? Not much to my surprise, he said that at one point in time, five or six years down the line, I want to be leading a design first company, design first mindset company. And then I had to clarify for my own sake that do you mean you want to become the design head of a design led company or do you want to be the CEO of that company that is extremely design first in their approach? Mm -hmm. He said that I want to become the CEO of a company which is extremely design first. Then the framework became even simpler for me to recommend that for that, you just don't need design skills. If you already have painted the picture five years down the line, mm -hmm. you should start like filling in your own arsenal with all the skill sets that are yeah. required for you to achieve that. Mm -hmm. Is it just design? No. It's going to be much more. You, mm -hmm. you should, yeah. if you have the opportunity, try to latch yourself with a company or an organization or a group of people who can give you a 360 degree view of building a company. Yeah. Because design is something that you have already identified and you can do it on a self-learning basis as well. Mm -hmm. right?
right? So if there's an opportunity where you get access to, let's say, marketing heads or uh, operation heads, logistic heads, uh, product heads directly, if I were in his position, I would have chosen that mm. because design yeah. to call Yeah. This access is something that I'll not get. Mm. Where will I find that direct access? Not in an extremely large company necessarily, uh, but in a very early stage company that is showing signs of good growth. Mm -hmm. Also a direct access to all of these smart folks yeah. from whom I can learn. Mm -hmm. So then these things make the choices much clearer. And like, as I reflect back on my decision when I, if I think about the companies I work with, so, uh, you know, when I joined Zomato, it was so open access to like, you know, we used to sit very close to the... Yeah, I'm sure, yes. yes. And it was, it was very good there. And yeah. I think um, at UC as well. So, so I think that really helps you. If, even if you have a question, you can... You don't have these, like, you know, levels of this thing. Yeah. You can just walk up to someone and, and like, you know, get your queries answered or if you are facing any dilemma. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's actually... Now, as we have talked about how someone should decide whether to join, how to join a company, how to think about, as you, uh, like for last, I think six years or so, you have been hiring designers as well, right? So I want to understand, how do you decide whether to hire someone or not? Like, and given the constraint that you haven't spent so much time with them, you have, let's say one meeting, two meeting, sometimes, uh, less than half an hour. How do you make that decision? Yeah, so first of all, the decision making process is slightly long, but the assessments can be fairly obvious sometimes. So typically, like over the period of years, the way we, we typically do it in a committee fashion. So every person in that committee is going to evaluate the candidate on a particular skill set or a particular area. It could be hard skill set, it could be soft skill set. It could be communication, it could be um, empathy, it could be how genuine that person is and so on and so forth. For me personally, what I typically look for is honesty and uh, I'll explain that there's not this theoretical and a vague word. So I typically look for honesty and potential. Like okay. These are the two things that I typically hunt for. Honesty because I think a person who's honest and self-aware mm -hmm. is much more important and valuable in it and it has not always been like that like this also has been inculcated by me over a period of years mm -hmm. i've seen that a lot of folks in the team they underperform most of the problem is not the competency part most okay. of the problem is not being self-aware mm -hmm. so for example if someone is creating a line of questions or doing some design activity and what i mean by design activity it could be research activities it could be the actual design uh, production of screens and so on and so forth Sometimes if the work is subpar, it's not good. It's hardly a matter of the actual competency, but it's mostly the part of that, that person themselves don't realize that this work is bad or this bad, this work that I have produced does not solve the core purpose. They're not self-aware. Mm. So someone needs to go and get into the reviews that, hey, you know what? See, you should have asked these five questions that should have given him the answer, but you did not. I think, oh, I did not. So it's, it's a matter, most of the time it's a matter of you don't know what you don't know. Okay. So what that means is that let's say you and I are in a team working on a particular project. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would have hired you knowing that you know or you have shown me mm -hmm. uh, projections of your past work. We could have gone through some design assessment, etc., which are nothing but a proxy to tap inside your brain. This is how you think. Mm -hmm. Okay. But when we are doing an actual project at work. And if I see that, why are you not performing well? There could only be a few reasons. One could be intent that, you know what? I don't really enjoy this one. Very clear cut, easy to take a call mm -hmm. in those situations. But if there is intent, yet you are not performing well. Most of the times what I have observed is that you are not even self aware that mm -hmm. something that I'm doing, the process is wrong yeah. or I need to get better. Mm -hmm. And that also happens because I don't question myself. Mm -hmm. So if I'm that person and I'm not performing well, I would assume that everything, I did everything as it was supposed to be. I am not critiquing my own work. I'm mm -hmm. just leaving it to peril that, yes, of course, this is how it is supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm living with a lot of assumptions, right? No, of course, I need to talk to only three users, not 20. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Of course, I need to uh, talk to only the Indian customers, not international ones, right? Yeah. So these are all the basis of assumptions that I'm living. Mm. Which means what? That I am not either expanding my horizon of self-awareness, mm. and I'm just limited to my own view. Flex in being honest. So if I identify someone who is genuinely very honest, they identify they are extremely good with identifying when the moment they are starting to slip. Mm-hmm. That hey, you know what? I worked on this amazing project in my last company. I really thought that I am the best designer in the world after I shipped this. But you know what? Like my manager or one of my peers, they came and said, "Hey, what the fuck is?" And I initially thought that no, I did it just right. This is what how I have been doing it in the past from the past five years. And then he pointed out that, but you know what? You did not even know. You did not even look at this data. I'm just like, holy shit! Oh yeah, right. Someone who accepts that mm. and is willing to work on it is an honest person, in my opinion. Right. Mm. So they are they are opening up to their vulnerabilities. They are saying that yes, I'm open to learning. I'm self-aware that yes, I can fuck up, but I'm also willing to learn more. Yeah. So so that is one of the most important things. And those are the people who form great teams. Mm. Uh, if there are folks who always are. In a situation that no, my mindset or the way of working for me is the way it is. They don't typically work out in a, in a team structure, right? So this is one. The second is potential. So yeah, let, let's pause here for a second. You said honesty, but it it is also being open-minded, accepting. Okay, so actually, I'm saying it could be intellectual honesty, right? Like. I, if I slip up, if I make a mistake, I'm willing to actually tell myself that yes, I would have made the mistakes, and I'm very much privately and uh, publicly open to accept that I have made a mistake, and I can learn from that, and we can actually like you know build something on top of that, like yes. more or less that yes. is right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I don't mean the honesty that yes, I'm going to perennially keep fucking up, but I'm honest about it. I'm fucking up. Right? So not that, right? So, and hence honesty and being self-aware they go hand in. I'm 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 skipping all the details where there are there are a couple of these hygiene table stake items that of course you need to be a nice person and all of that which is under our recruitment criteria. But these are the no no. What's that? Like like I I I don't want to go like you know you to explain all these points, but like if you could just mention like. Uh, top three. So top two are basically honesty slash being self-aware. If that reflects and gets established during an interview process during our conversation, so that is one of the things that I heavily look for. Second is the potential. Mm-hmm. Third would be you're a fun person to work with. Okay. Uh, to me, that's personally extremely important. We are not robots. We are not clerical following a set of guidelines. I genuinely feel that, especially for startups. The environment is quite demanding. The projects that I would give you are going to be very demanding, right? And the ones that I'll keep for myself are also demanding. So it's demanding for everyone. Yes. And the approach is very simple. That if you are spending majority of our life's time in a very demanding environment, we should give our best foot forward to make it fun as. Uh, so the person needs to be fun. And I think what I have seen is that. Fun people, they are good at user research mm. uh, because they truly want to connect with the user. They will have conversations with them. They are not going to get into an interview mode. That again, the prescription mode yes. versus genuinely yes. So all of yeah. these things tie back. They they tie together. I've seen some of the best folks who interview. They are extremely fun. They will probably meet some of the customers over drinks mm. and not even open up the app or whatever. Right? They will just talk for half an hour. Yeah. And then spend the last fifteen minutes just talking about the app, and that's when the person is feeling open enough to share with them that true main yeah. cause of not liking something. Yeah, it's, it's it's very different. One thing that so I was writing a discussion guide for a user research once, and I remember that from the past experience, I wrote down. I I wrote everything down like you know this is the hygiene these are these types of questions you should ask these are the types of question you should not ask this can the exact uh, this these question can be the exact questions you can ask to the customer and in the end I wrote like or like big or to everything that if the user has started having a like telling you a story 
or like he's started having a conversation random conversation try to like you know lean him towards the thing that you want to talk about yeah but don't get into the questioning yeah. mode and let him tell the story yeah because he's he's being very open to you right now you can literally get a lot of tons of insight yeah and he and you can actually go back and ask him a lot of questions yes. and you will uh, so and it also helps you get away from that mind that thing that where you just say something and does something else yeah. to they are being very honest like you and i are friends right i can tell you anything that i am facing but if you come to me and ask me a bunch of questions i i, I might not be that open to like you know exactly. share that with you makes sense yeah and all of this is already as i keep mentioning right all of this if even if this skill set does not come to someone naturally mm-hmm. there are processes for it we yeah. do swot analysis mm-hmm. right we we do exercises where we plot matrices that yeah. this is what the user said versus this is what they tell versus mm-hmm. this is what they think versus this is what they do yeah we have a framework for it mm-hmm. then what is stopping us from exercising the same thing makes sense so you mentioned about hygiene things as well in a candidate uh, like could you like briefly tell us like a few of those things like you mentioned being a nice person right what what other things are there? so being nice is one uh, being competent is another so of course like we're definitely looking for folks who know their shit mm. to simply put if we are hiring uh, someone as a design engineer we would expect them to do their job right mm. so that is the hygiene right? that mm. is the core job description so oh, anything which is our job description like that is to us hygiene mm. uh, if you are hiring a motion designer we would of course expect them to know the tools that are required for it right yeah uh um, so all of those in the hard skill department are the hygiene in the soft skill department i would say the person has to be nice they have to be non assholes they have to be friendly fun especially because all of these attributes something that we have identified that in the team typically makes them thrive that's it so constantly every time we look for new folks as in we are hiring right now uh, yeah. we plan to hire like 10 15 more folks in the team So what we do is we start looking back that this is our current team what is working for the team what kind of attributes typically mm. work what kind of projects really work mm. and what are the traits of those projects like some projects might have seen phenomenal success mm. or the working relationship between a designer and a pm and an engineer was yeah. extremely well so as recruiters we typically keep an eye for those like what are those traits so if i can just multiply those traits mm. i'll try to take those traits and look out and see if some of the candidates are sharing those traits or not and then i know naturally that these kind of candidates are going to do extremely well mm-hmm. in an environment like ours yeah and it makes sense and uh, it actually connects with something i i i totally believe or am aligned with is if you want to judge a culture of like any company or any organization what you have to do is you have to just look at the people that company is keeping right and because the people actually decides what is the culture there right yeah. and and as you rightly mentioned that uh, when we are looking for new folks we see what we currently have yeah and what's the what's the like you know formula for success for these people uh, these people that yeah. we already have and I, i and it's a balance yeah. like even for us it's a balance because if i give you the diet analogy it's a very uh, typical and uh, like a famous way of interviewing someone for their dieting preferences so if i ask someone that what did you what are you what is your diet what do you typically have for dinner let's mm-hmm. say i have only chicken breasts and uh, two rotis that's it so very optimistic mm-hmm. that there is a very lean diet but if you ask them what did you have for lunch mm-hmm. that is something that they don't have to think about that's because i had just had lunch yeah. right and then say ki i had biryani such a contrast right so there is something that you already do versus there is something that you want to be mm. where you want to be so in design teams it's very similar so what we do is we keep we try to keep a weighted balance that what is working for us mm. so we will definitely try to look for those traits mm. so those become the table stakes or hygiene for us yeah. versus we also try to identify the voids what is it that we are missing right now mm. maybe we realize that we are missing some sort of fast experiment mindset mm. maybe we are missing that mm. so we'll look for someone who's extremely proficient with a tool but is equally a crazy person mm. 
that person you you leave that person to themselves yeah. they will set and keep on identifying based on the research insights and keep building their own prototypes maybe that is where we are not at mm. so as long as we qualify the hygiene we are going to look for that new trait that you know what we what have extra you bring to exactly. the, the team right makes sense now i have last two three questions sure. before we get into the audience's questions so like you know uh, in, in in like you know could you briefly tell us what like as you go through a lot of uh, candidates profile and you meet you will interview a lot of designers right what's the one mistake most new designers i would say this is actually quite funny but without an exception uh, most of the junior designers they typically come up with a case study that tries to follow a design process mm-hmm. that we spoke to the user mm-hmm. we created some journeys we created some personas and then right after that here are the one without an exception i think all of like 0 to 2 years of experience of designers they all share the same exact characteristics i honestly don't know where they're getting it from that they have to follow this structure because while some of it makes sense some of it doesn't Mm-hmm. so for example if i were to look at a case study which by definition is fictitious mm-hmm. right it's hypothetical what do you want me to get out of this case study mm-hmm. that one can you think of a new problem statement that you just made up or are you trying to tell me that i made up a problem statement and then i'm trying to show you how i solved that same problem statement so there might not be anything wrong with this so far but i said that hey you know what what if i have to redesign this so far what am i going to do i'm going to do some user interviews ask them hey dude how are you finding this so far uncomfortable what did you change about it and then i created a persona out of you mm-hmm. and then i proposed a new solution for so does this give me any value about what is your competency it doesn't does it even give me a value that on one screen of your pdf you're showing me that here is this persona here is this neha verwal who is a 32 40 year old female working in an mnc in bombay she uses whatsapp etc etc these are her hobbies these are her whatever lifestyle and the immediate next screen is a wife in like how did you go from here to here right all of these things are missing and most of it i think we should just discard all of that i would rather have folks and there's one mistake that i feel almost all of them without exception what becomes helpful is that showing the intent mm-hmm. that you know what i want to explore user research mm-hmm. so what i did instead was that i am i'm curious about certain apps that i did mm-hmm. and i wanted to know if there is any more value add that i can bring in yeah so for example if people are using google maps a lot of people do right so it's already an established case study it, there's an app that exists can i just latch on to that and see if there are more opportunities to be found mm-hmm. or not and i'm trying to show you that how i conduct those things mm-hmm. that gives me 10x more value and yeah. insight on how you as a person are working versus a dummy case studies so i think if i had to put it in a sentence it is it, it would be like i think we have some way down the line romanticized the idea of publishing case studies as portfolio case studies are hypothetical most of the times we make up the problems ourselves ourselves and we try to project that you know what so as we are hiring at uc according to you put someone at the top of um, like you know our pipe it's almost all the things that i just mentioned right we need someone to be able to communicate what they have worked on what they are good at what they are not good at so probably the background on this side of the story would help folks who do really well at uc in the design team they are essentially very good communicators so mm-hmm. that is one and uh, that is paramount what i mean by that is uh, we are in a business that requires a lot of stakeholder management mm-hmm. by definition we are not necessarily just changing one thing within the app mm. we want to deliver good services experience that requires us to communicate with the product manager with the engineering team with the business stakeholders with mm-hmm. the cxp stakeholders and everyone right so someone should be able to get and grasp a lot of these concepts mm-hmm. uh, fast and deliver on those mm-hmm. across stakeholders so it does not naturally translate to that hey you know what is my job going to be stakeholder management so no. and that's where the good communication bit comes in yeah. either you design and publish your case study within the company in such a way that it does not require further communication everyone gets it oh yes that's obvious mm-hmm. right so and hence i don't say stakeholder management i say good communication how you do it is completely up to you yeah. 
if someone is able to communicate that directly without having to even schedule a one on one interview right that is the second stage right but since your question is that how do i ensure that someone immediately short circuits their way to the top of the list mm-hmm. is if they work on a i don't know resume like take your pick mm-hmm. uh, if you want to just write a long email if you just want to write your case study in the form of your website and say that hey you not know visit my website you will get to know what i mean or in the form of a cover letter whatever it is we don't put much hard restrictions on format we go with the standard that typically give us a resume we should we should basically depict that what is the kind of stuff that you have done we have never asked people to write their college education or which year did they pass out and all of that we just said send us your resume what does that mean we just need you to communicate that you know what i have worked at x and i have experience in solving for x kind of things mm. i have also worked at y for so many years so that has given me the depth in yz things right and so on so as long as whatever it takes for you to communicate to us that this is what you are getting right so anyone who's able to do that like they would immediately find themselves being reached out to much faster it makes sense uh, totally like we we are also open to a lot of these ideas someone might even just come up to us and say that you need me mm. and i'll tell you why you need me yeah. if they can give us that reason and say oh it makes sense mm. yes we do need you like yeah. come on board so we never put details around like what should be in your resume what should be in your cover letter what should be in your portfolio mm. it's completely up to that person so one of the interesting things uh, like i when i was actually seeing all the design stuff that we as an urban company put out one of the things that stood out to me we don't care about if you don't have a portfolio we can actually judge like you know your competency and things from the assignment that you do uh, sure. yeah uh, and actually it works either way so what do we try to do with the portfolio or the assignment right? mm-hmm. we try to see that yes you are putting your work where your mouth is So if you're saying that hey, you know what I have done good shit in the past, mm-hmm. show us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if you show that to us, we should be able to ask you questions about the details of that project. Yeah. Just to check the genuinity of it. Mm-hmm. That yes, you are the person who drove the things that you said that in your portfolio that you did. Mm-hmm. So that is where the honesty part comes in, Got right? It. So I'll I'll give you a very specific example to drive this point. There was a point in time when uh, I was doing an interview with this person uh, for a fairly senior role. and that person said that you know what we redesigned this entire thing i was the whole i was the whole in all of this and it showed us immense success mm. i got one level deeper and it was a curiosity question right so i simply asked them okay fine so how much time did you invest in redesigning this and what was the impact that person did not have answers and that immediately depicted like it was it was pretty, pretty obvious that this was not an hands on person's work like this person is not the one who did the hands on work probably it's a collective project mm-hmm. and this person in the interview is trying to take do yeah. credit snatch it which you don't mind actually as long as you know that he did right mm-hmm. you can simply come up to us and say this is a team my team did it and this was my contribution to it i did the stakeholder management it or i just made sure that this project was a part of the roadmap that could be the contribution but that mm-hmm. is honestly right mm-hmm. so portfolio reviews is exactly that we want to know that you are saying that you are good show us With with the help of whatever you have with you, mm. that you are good. Mm. Either you do that with the portfolio. We also understand that we are in the startup ecosystem. We ourselves don't have time, and if we are looking out for a new opportunity, we might not even have the time to sit down and build a portfolio. We also are very conscious that I have to spend a lot of time in designing my portfolio. Forget about yeah. it, because if I apply with a shabby portfolio, the other person is going to judge me that hey, you know what, mm. this is not a good design. Mm. Okay. so we understand all of that and we and we don't try to discount all of those efforts right and hence we say that even if you don't have a portfolio just start a conversation it's completely fine mm. what's going to happen we still have that need that we want to tap inside your brain mm. and we want to know what is the kind of stuff that you're good at hence the assignment bit comes in and even in assignments we are extremely conscious about the fact that in design we will never give an assignment which is linked with use Avoid biases. Yeah, right. Yeah. So we we try to have the conversations with you. We try to gauge what kind of projects you will be successful at, mm. and we try to give you an assignment around that direction. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. 
that oh. makes sense. Oh. So, like, you know, just a small question here before we get into the audience's questions. Uh, the people who are watching this, if someone is a designer and wants to join us, like, as we are hiring as well, why should they join us as a designer? And what's in it for them? Yeah, sure. Three things that I can think of very clearly. One is the tribe in itself. Mm. And I only sell what I have personally experienced. If you remember, I mentioned that back in the days I was in the services mm -hmm. uh, company and then I started one yeah. before joining into a broader company. So before that, one of the things that I realized is that going deep into a problem statement cannot be done in silo. Mm. Okay. So you need a tribe to keep pushing. At UC, I feel we have the right combination of the tribe. Right? So everyone is very mission driven. Everyone wants to solve for services experience because all of us will take it ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. And we feel that any designer who's coming within the team, we feel fairly confident about their growth. Mm -hmm. That if you want to grow as a designer, if you want to grow as a creator, mm -hmm. if you want to grow as a person who adds value of any kind, it could be in the form of a design, it could be in the form of a developer, it could be in the form of ideas, whatever it is. I think we have a very good platform where you have a mixed bag of business folks, design folks, folks who are just focusing on one country uh, for that matter. This combination is very hard to get into the ecosystem. And uh, I feel very happy about the fact that even after six years, UC has maintained that platform that anyone who joins it, they have this exposure and access to all of these people who we internally call as, let's say, the tribe uh, to push everyone to do their best. So this is one of the reason. So if you are, if any of you, like if you are interested and if you are looking for a reason on why to join UC, so you will get that right. As simple as that. The second thing is we invest in people a lot. So what I mean by that is, as I mentioned, we typically don't look at the skill set driven design angle. We look at the mindset. Yeah. So what we try to do is that after any, after a person joins the team, one of the things, one of the exercises that we do over the next six months uh, of their joining is try to create their growth path. You joining the team, you might have your own personal goals, you have your own uh, professional goals and so on and so forth. But you're spending a lot of time with us. Yeah. You, I feel that you have chosen to invest your time of your prime days or prime yeah. years in a company like UC, which is a startup, mm -hmm. right? Where otherwise you could have gone into a big corporation or so I feel that you have given us a chance that, hey, you know what, I would definitely want to be part of this journey. One of the things that we try to give in return is that we'll help you grow in this career path. So what we try to do is we try to uh, create a growth charter for every individual that joins the team within their next six months. Mm -hmm. So you tell us that, hey, you know what, I want to do X, Y, Z things. I want to become better at giving presentations mm -hmm. or I want to work with the CEO directly, at least in two to three projects. Yeah. What we try to do collectively is that we try to find projects that support your growth path directly. Mm -hmm. So we try to align the company goals to the team goals to your goals. Mm -hmm. And we also try to find opportunities for making you even better. For example, if someone says that, hey, you know what, I want to get better at giving presentations. Mm -hmm. We will try to link you with certain projects running across the company where you will have the direct access and opportunity to demonstrate and practice those skill sets. Mm -hmm. For example, someone can say that, hey, you know what, I want to improve my motion design skill set. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. So we will try to find opportunities across the companies where this skill set might be used and will expose you to those things. If someone says that, hey, you know what, after five years, I want to become a design head. It could be something like that as well. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. If that is the case, starting six months from now, we are going to start introducing certain responsibilities for you. Mm. You start demonstrating and respond to those responsibilities. As you keep growing, we'll try to carve out a path for you. Right? So the second is the growth, right? We truly care about this person who's joining us. So your interest is aligned with, our interest is aligned with yours and yeah. yours is aligned with us. Yeah, it, it can never be 100%, but we genuinely yeah. try our best. Yeah. And the third is the impact. The third is impact because at the end of the day, we all strive to add some value in the world. I feel that in UC, we have that opportunity mm -hmm. that where there is so much fuck up in the services experience outside in the world. Every service that we deliver, it helps a partner, a real professional who's earning that money, is relying on us 
uh, for their day to day livelihood mm-hmm. and on the other hand the customers who are relying on us to get that job done mm-hmm. i think as a designer as creators right uh, uh, it could be as an engineer or as a product manager when you build something and you get to see in real life your friends your family using that service and getting i don't know like even sad about it or happy about it but you get a gratification yeah that feeling i think like that part is priceless so i think that is very quick to experience in uc because we have faster release cycles you can immediately get to see the impact of the work that you had done one week ago and you can directly get to see it yeah so these are the three things if these three things align with any of you feel free to apply yeah. so now as we rolled out the form to our audience and we asked them if they have any questions for you we have got like a few of them so i'll be asking you that so Saurav here asks this question, which is I think I have uh, also gone through this journey, and you have also. So, how to build uh, a design team in a startup, being yourself the first one as a designer? Got it. Um, few things. I think it's not too hard. I think it's very important to understand the the business, the founders, mm-hmm. and their vision. So, for example, back in the days. the kind of recruitment or the kind of folks i would hire for let's say a fusion charts mm-hmm. or for some teams at housing would be very different and has been very different for the first set of designers we hired at uc mm-hmm. because the business requirements are very very different yeah. so i think nailing that part is most important mm-hmm. some teams by definition would require more heavy lifting on interaction design mm-hmm. on uh, user experience on user interface by the mode of their business yeah some businesses would require the designers to be extremely data aware mm-hmm. so you need different kind of competencies yeah so for the first two years at uc back in 2016 we only hired product designers we did mm-hmm. not hire ui designers we did not hire ux designers or research designers right? we needed a specific kind yeah. of skill set which is you should be aware of how to deal with actual hard data and translate those into designs so that was extremely clarifying for us that for a team like this we needed to have this kind of skill set mm-hmm. and so your target also narrows down uh, so i would say like this is the most important thing right and the second thing i think which has always worked is to start talking about what you're trying you'll be amazed and i have also been amazed with how many people associate with the problem statement the the mission uh, yeah. like mission of the company or the problem statement the yeah. whole organization is yeah so and third thing is don't oversell i have seen a lot of folks at startups who say hey you know what join this most amazing company in the world and your life will change and all of that right and uh, the counter is always if you are already so amazing what the fuck am i supposed to come and call? so i i don't think people seek help as much So I think just changing that articulation a yeah. little bit helps and goes along. Mm-hmm. Last question, I think we have covered it. He asked, "How do you measure UX maturity of a prospect company where you might be willing to take a switch?" Most of the times, it's either obvious or you don't know what is happening on other ones. Yeah. If it is extremely obvious, you directly see in the product, mm. right? Whatever the product is, you will see that yes, of course, because the output is this. This company is UX mature, but UX has so many dimensions to it that sometimes you actually need to speak with a lot of folks inside. Yeah. Because what we see on the app and versus what is actually happening behind the scenes, very complex systems. Yeah. So I can simply look at a bro app, a bro version of it. Very simple, nothing, right? Mm-hmm. And I will say that this company is extremely UX focused. Mm-hmm. Uh, bro, are you like one of these apps that had become very popular a couple of years ago? You would say, okay, like just going by the app, you would say that this is very UX focused. But if you go behind the scenes and talk to the user, like what value are you getting out of it? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Is it truly a UX focused company? Uh, so I think the only proxy to that is uh, your best bet is actually speaking to speaking as many to, people yeah, as possible yeah. and create your own opinion. Yeah. And when I was uh, making a switch from Zomato to uh, UC, I actually talked to uh, like. Five six people before even starting the process. Yeah, right. Deepak asks which company to choose, product basis or uh, product based. I think we have covered it yeah. uh, in depth. I think that's fine. Yeah, th- this question is actually very relevant for you, which is 
how to lead an already established design team. So if you are joining as a VP of design in a company where there is a team already there, right? How do you lead? Yeah, so I think in my experience that happened once. So when I joined housing, there was already a team in mm-hmm. place led by Shohani. Yeah. And uh, I joined to lead one of the sub teams of data science labs. And it only happened much later that I was uh, part leading the entire team. I might have done some fuck ups over there as well in terms of like managing that large scale of a team. What I have seen work the best is to uh, establish your credibility at the very beginning mm-hmm. and uh, then go about leading that. Like, don't start bossing around from day one. Yeah. Right. So if there is an already established team, so for example, this time around when I came back after almost three years of break back in UC, the team was already pretty big then where I, and it was more important for me to just establish that what is the value that I'm bringing onto the table than the fact that, hey, you know what, you guys have a new boss. So I think go value first, that always helps. Mm. Yeah. So like, you know, he has a for, he has asked another question is, how to build a design team where people care about like, you know, finding the uh, real problems, what, what's the cause of those problems? And stuff. Yeah, so show value, that is the shortest answer. What I mean by that is, there is no playbook that, hey, you know what, here's this formula, go and stitch it to an organization, now you're a research focused mm. organization, yeah. right? Everything needs to have value. So, just for context, over here as well, we're trying to build an internal research function altogether, which will spread across the entire organization. And we have done that at Cuddle as well. Mm-hmm. Cuddle is the last out of where I was working. And the value is very simple. Am I confident that there are some areas of the business which is still not getting covered? Right? I still don't know why a partner can use a Takatak fluently, mm-hmm. but not a UC partner app. Mm-hmm. None of the data that I have at my disposal is answering those. Mm-hmm. Where can I get those insights? Yeah. I need to find some insights. One of the methods that I know is to deploy a research focused set of people. Once I deploy them, and they come back and say that, hey, you know what, these are the insights that I have. Mm-hmm. That is a direct value add to the company. Mm-hmm. And I just keep multiplying them. And over a period of time, we realize that this is the value that these kind of people are bringing. This function of research is bringing. Mm-hmm. And that's when the company steers towards this yeah. function to look for answers. Mm-hmm. So back in the day, if you think about it, right? So when UC might have started, they would founders looking at each other for answers. Mm-hmm. Now the founders would be looking at Let's say a business team for certain kind of answers. They would be looking at the product team for certain kind of answers. When would they start looking at a research focused team? Mm. Researchers who are giving the answers. Yeah. Yeah. So that I think is a starting point. So the formula is simple in a way that you get one, prove the value, multiply it. And then yeah. with more and more incursion, you will basically see that the company is naturally uh, going towards the research team. Tom speaks, like if yeah. you show the result on one side, people are willing to trust you to do some more in that direction. Yeah, that's the exact same journey for every function. Mm. When design was first established in UC, one of my job was not to do all of this, right? The mm. job was to even show that this is value. the value that design can even bring on to the game. So last question from the audience before we wrap this up is this person is, a, you know, a UX designer in a manufacturing IT company. Okay. I don't know exactly, but I'm looking to become a product manager slash designer. What career path should I follow? The first step is to pick one. Yeah. Like if you want to become a designer or a product manager mm-hmm. and then understand what that means. But it it typically sounds like that that person could either be confused or is weighing his option. So I would say like first you should be doing the research and understanding why do you want to do it and then pick which is the best way to do it. Yeah. If you want to work on identifying problem statements and directly work with designers and engineers and do a lot of these things, probably product manager, yeah. otherwise whatever, right? But how? Mm-hmm. First step is be clear what you which one. Yeah. Thank you so much, Amit. I think uh, that was all before I think we wrap up. So one last question before we wrap up: What's the best way to reach out to you? Twitter, Twitter at Godkeys. That's the best way to reach out to. You. Uh, and you'll find it in the description as well. Thank you so much, Amit. It was yeah. lovely talking to you. Uh, we look forward to doing uh, one more soon, maybe in Bangalore. Okay, sure. No Thank problem. you so much.